gonna mug me. I'm not gonna mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. This is New Zealand, Aotearoa. We're blessed with great mountains, beautiful sweeping beaches, and wild rivers. Over 180,000 kilometres of them. As a mountainous island chain in a boisterous corner of the world's largest ocean, our rainfall can be massive, making our rivers turbulent and unpredictable. I'm Craig Potton, and I've been photographing New Zealand landscapes just like these for 40 years. I just love it. It's my passion. Make an art out of the mountains, out of the forests, out of the coastline, and out of our rivers. For me, they are the arteries that connect everything together. I'm going to travel some great New Zealand rivers, each one with its own story. Wow, this is nice. I'll meet people who care for rivers and the creatures which live in and around them. And what a beautiful little letters. I'll journey between source and sea and try to understand how rivers have shaped the land and influenced our culture. But above all, I want to see if we can use our rivers wisely and protect their wildness for our children. The Waikato is New Zealand's longest river. It begins high in the mountains of Tongariro National Park and flows for a total of 425 kilometres across Lake Taupo, past the famous Hooker Falls, through a geothermal field and a cluster of hydroelectric dams. It travels through Derry Country and Hamilton City until it meanders out into the Tasman Sea at Port Waikato. The Waikato is used intensively by tourism, by dairy farming and by the towns winding along its banks. And while farming, hydro schemes and urban development have created problems for the river, there are moves to rehabilitate this mighty waterway. This is the Waikato. The source of the Waikato begins in the great stratovolcanoes of Ruapehu and Tongariro and flows largely underground across the sacred Rangapo Desert. It reappears here and heads towards Lake Taupo. I first started photographing these mountains 23 years ago for a book marking the centenary of Tongariro National Park and celebrating the gift of these peaks by the Maori tribe Tuwharatoa to our nation. While I was taking these photographs of Ruapehu's 1996 eruption, the helicopter was shaking from the static electricity pulsing from the explosions. Looking into the epicenter of the eruption was like looking into hell. But that was nothing compared to the eruptions that form New Zealand's largest lake, Lake Taupo. It's hard to imagine on a placid day like this on Lake Taupo that I'm actually sitting on one of the most violent volcanoes on the whole planet. The most excessive eruption that's occurred in the last 5,000 years occurred here in the year 200 AD. We know it occurred then because in Roman history and in Chinese history, the skies turn red for over three years. And we can mark that not only from the history books, but also because there are bits of pumice like this found all around the coastline of New Zealand, from Invercargill right up to Cape Rianga, you can find little bits of pumice and they all mark the eruption of Taupo. Over a million people visit the Taupo region every year and not far downstream from where the Waikato River leaves Lake Taupo is one of New Zealand's most popular tourist attractions. At this point the river is channeled through a narrow canyon at 200 cubic metres a second before hitting an 11 metre drop to create the famous Hooker Falls. Wow, there's human power in this jetty little jet boat and there's natural power in this Hooker Falls. I think at this point we'll give way to the natural power. 
In Europe and America, big rivers like the Danube and the Mississippi, well they've been used for carrying freight and for carrying people for centuries. So when the first settlers came to New Zealand and started to look at our rivers, they found it wasn't quite so easy. And the reasons are features like this, the Hooker Falls. There are many rapids and waterfalls in New Zealand rivers that there just aren't on those European and American rivers. That made it very hard to get up. But it did give a feature that became important in its own right, important to tourism. And in fact, on the Waikato, when the dam builders, looking for hydroelectric power from this river, got to the hooker, they were told by the tourists in no uncertain terms, don't dam this fall, it's very beautiful. And luckily, this time, the tourists won. And I wonder why sometimes so many people come to this place just to look at water falling over a rock ledge. And I think maybe the philosophers, the poets like Coleridge, like Wordsworth, actually had a point when they talked about the sublime, about awe, about something that's more powerful than us. And perhaps it's that which drives us just to come again and again and look in to places like Hooker Falls. Local operators have long realised the value of the river in attracting the tourist dollar. Just a few hundred metres upstream from the falls is Hooker Lodge which started life as a fishing lodge in the 1920s and is now one of New Zealand's most exclusive retreats. Hi. I'm meeting lodge manager Mark Welters. Great to be here, thank you. When did the, the new owner come and, and what do you think brought him here? Um, I think 25 years ago when he took over the property, the main reason for him coming here was falling in love with the beauty of the Waikato River. Really? Yeah, because I'm very interested to hear that he's actually involved in planting and you're involved in planting lots of native forest around here. That's correct. So right from the beginning, 25 years ago, we uh, planted a huge amount of native plants throughout the property. So this is very much high-end tourism. I mean, it's wonderful to stay here, but yes. um, quite expensive. I mean, why do you think do people actually come? Well, I think it's increasingly more difficult in the world to find beauty like this. And um, because of that, a lot of people are drawn to the attraction of it. Mm. I did read in the visitor's book that Bryce Courtney said it's all about the river. That's correct. He did say one of the main reasons for coming to the lodge is it's all about the river. What does it provide for guests? I mean, obviously just a solace of sitting beside it, but um, fishing or uh, other... Fishing is one of the main reasons for coming to the lodge, but uh, also just the tranquility and the natural beauty and the deep turquoise colour which captures a lot of people. A lot of what we're doing to rivers these days is not good with certain industries like dairying, with hydro development, and our waters are not always clean and green. I guess it's very important they are to tourism. It is very important uh, for tourism, but especially for Hooker Lodge, because it's part of that visual picture which people especially come for uh, mm. all over the world to see. So we have to keep it that way. There's been an uneasy relationship on this river between the potential for tourism and the demand for power. Fortunately, the Hooker Falls were left alone, but six kilometres downstream, an unusual compromise was reached at Aratiatea. In the 1960s, a power station was built here, diverting the river and causing the famed Aratiatea rapids to disappear. But the spillway is opened three or four times a day to let the rapids flow for the benefit of kayakers and tourists. Hi, guys. Hey, Craig. Howdy. Hey, yeah. One of you is Ben and one Jared? Yeah, I'm Ben. Jared. Good to meet you. Yeah, so it's a placid river now, but I understand the next half hour water level's going to rise very suddenly. Yep, the water's going to be probably a couple of metres above our heads. How does this rapid relate in terms of grades, in terms of you know degree of difficulty? Oh, this rapid rates very highly on a, um, on a national scale. It's probably uh, one of the most revered rapids in the country. It, uh, it's obviously very unique in the fact that it, it only gets released for half an hour, um, three or four times a day, which... Uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, unique in the world from what I've seen in my travels. But yeah, it, it's definitely at the higher end of what is possible in a kayak at the moment and in, in kayaking worldwide. It is a shame to see what was obviously a, a pretty special and, uh, and, and scenic place be um, controlled by man and, and to have the dam and the uh, electricity generation here. But yeah, I guess it's not ideal, but it's better than having no rapid at all. What does the Waikato mean to you personally? Being New Zealand's longest and largest river, the Waikato obviously has, has with it a bit of mystique. I grew up on the banks of the Waikato River in Hamilton, so you know I grew up swimming in it and, and jumping off cliffs into it. And then um, once I started kayaking, you know there was always the draw back to the Waikato River. And you know within her banks, she's got some of the most renowned and I guess the rapids with the most mana in the country. 
Hill gates are open, the water gushes into the narrow gorge at 90 cubic metres a second, and the results are spectacular. Up, I explore a little known part of the Waikato. Since humans first arrived here, the Waikato has been used as a route for transport and communication, as a source of food, water, power and tourism. And the demands we've placed on this river have become greater and greater. This glass of water came from the river. I had a shower this morning. I flushed the toilet. The electric light that I switched on comes from hydro power generated by the river. Even had a cup of coffee this morning. Put milk in it. That milk comes from dairying. It has a big impact on the river. So the big question is just how much can we take from the Waikato? The first dam was built on the river nearly 100 years ago at Horahora Hora in 1913. That dam has since been submerged under Lake Karapiro. But it was the first in a series of constructions which would harness the river's power over the next 70 years. The Tongariro Power Scheme channels water from 2,600 square kilometres of catchment, north and east of Mount Ruapehu, into a network of tunnels, canals and aqueducts through five dams and two power stations at Takanu and Rangapo. Beyond Taupo, there are a further eight power stations with dams controlling the river's flow for 125 kilometres from the lake to the final dam at Karapiro. We build a lot of hydro in New Zealand, or have built a lot of hydro in the past, because of the geography of the country. A lot of water falls on the tops of the hills, providing a lot of energy that then flows down through the rivers, and that's a, an excellent source of, of bulk energy for, for meeting the needs of New Zealand. Uh, many countries with, with flatter landscapes simply do not have that resource. And the disadvantages of hydro? There's not really much in the way of disadvantages of hydroelectric. Power. Um, once it's installed and in place and running, um, it does its thing, it's, it's, it's available when we need it. It just runs continuously or as, as required without causing any particular adverse effects on the environment. But of course there are adverse effects when the dams are built and the areas behind them are flooded, the lakes silt up and the native fish die out. When the Oakuri Dam was built, it changed an important part of the landscape forever. The geothermal wonderland known as Orake Karako. Hi. Hello. I'm Craig. Nairi. Nairi. Sure. I'm heading out onto Lake Oakuri on a 100-year-old riverboat, the Wairaka. We're on a hydro lake here, and just underneath us, out to the side here, were several major geysers. They've been lost because of our overdevelopment of this wonderful river. Before 1961, Orake Korako was a significant geyser field boasting some of the world's largest geysers. But the lake created by the dam flooded several spectacular geysers and many hot springs. Fortunately, not all of this geothermal wonderland was drowned. There are a few geysers and some significant hot springs left. And after the obliteration of the famous pink and white terraces by the Mount Tarawera eruption of 1886, Orake Karako now has the country's largest silica terraces. Geothermal areas are a good chance to look into the Earth's interior. It's hot magma down there, and when rainwater filters down and meets that hot magma, then it brings up with it chemicals and elements and minerals, and they form on the surface in these very bright colours, and they mix in there with algae and bacteria, and that gives you that extraordinary colour that you see in a geothermal place.
your wonderful craft, Shane. Where did it come from? Yeah, um, it's one of the original Whanganui river boats. Um, built in Scotland by a firm called Yarrow & Co. Built for the Hattrick fleet in Whanganui. And then it was um, pulled apart in, in Scotland and then rebuilt in Whanganui and then sailed up to Tamaranui to, to spend its first 30 years of its life up there. This is pretty flat water. Do you think I might have a drive? Oh, you, you're, you're more than welcome. You're more <laughs> no, than welcome. Thank you. It's a great feeling being on a grand old boat. So what's its top speed? Not a racer, I guess. Uh, 17 knots downstream with a six knot current behind it. <laughs> <laughs> There's one other place I want to see while I'm here, a secret spot known as the Squeeze, and for good reason. Quite a little struggle and a squeeze to get up here, but at the end is a hot geothermal waterfall. The water here is a toasty 38 degrees, perfect for a warm shower. Oreke Karako has a long history for local Māori, who were drawn here because of the geothermal properties. Our eponymous ancestor, his name was Tahumatua, when he arrived from Hawaii to uh, Aotearoa, he, he stopped at a number of places, but his final resting place was here at Orake Korako. And so Tahumatua gave due consideration to the area, one, because of its beauty, two, because of all the native forest that used to be around at one time, three, because of the river, and four, because of the geothermal. A great combination for uh, any community, I think. But the river also has a spiritual meaning for us. The river has its own life force. It dictates how that life force uh, wants to exist. Um, it reacts when that life force is, uh, is uh, disturbed. And I think um, what you're seeing from the river in terms of the level of pollution that there is there now is a reaction by the Modi of the river. When the Oahuri Dam was built, the tribe's ancestral burial caves were flooded and their marae had to be moved downstream. But now geothermal draw-off from the nearby Ohaki power station is causing problems for the new marae. Our marae is subject to subsidence and uh, the experts tell us it has already subsided by three metres. In a few years' time, this whole area will be underwater. So again, in the name of power generation, uh, we will have to relocate, as we did at Orake Korako. The company, Contact Energy, accepts a level of liability, and they are working with us to try and provide a remedy. The first thing that came up was how you're going to feel when the water... Runs. After the break, musician Dave Dobbin plays me a song inspired by the Waikato. ...and one line. Kiwis are river rats by nature, so it comes as no surprise that we are among the world's top rowing nations. This is Lake Karapiro, and this stretch of water has produced more world champions than any other. Today I'm going for a paddle with Rebecca Scarn. And how long is your balance because you don't even want to make those She's one of our top female rowers and could be our next Olympic champion. This is my second. <laughs> I'd imagined powering across the lake with our oars cutting through the water in unison, but unfortunately these are lightweight speed machines that could overturn with any sudden movement, so it's my job to steady the ship. Now you just sit there and I'll just... Oh, okay, I'll be the balancer. Yeah. Out here this morning, it's not hard to see why this is such a great venue for rowing. It's such a nice long lake, so you can row for um, long distances without stopping, which gives us, I think, an advantage compared to other countries who do end up rowing 
the majority of their time on man-made 2k courses and just having to go back and forth so yeah we do we do get the luxury of being able to row um, a long way without turning around. You come from Wanganui, another great North Island river, but what is it about the Waikato, what about the moods of it that you like or dislike? Some days we come down here and it'll be really rough and horrible and you won't like it at all, but then other days we come down here and it's perfectly flat and you have beautiful sunny mornings, which you just can't help but, but love being out on the water. But you get misty mornings in winter, I imagine. Um, yeah, it can get really foggy and really cold um, some days. So it's beautiful when it clears, but it can be a little bit painful when you're trying to train through that sometimes. So. Right. Yeah. Well, if we head away, um, yeah. should I do the balance and you do the rowing, given um, our respective strengths? Yeah, that sounds good. The Waikato River might look beautiful, but under the surface, it is seriously polluted due to the intensive dairy farming along its banks. Runoff from cow's waste and fertilizers pours too many nutrients into the river, causing an increase in plant life and reducing the oxygen native fish need to survive. You can't see the nutrients. The rivers sort of look okay unless you try and walk in them or fish in them and they're all slippery and there's no fish in them. But otherwise, that, when you look out the car window, it looks the same. If, if the nutrient was like smoke coming out of factories and you could see it rising off all these farms and joining together in the sky, then people would, would say, no way, we've got to stop this. But it, it's kind of... You know, people don't see it happening, and so it just it just quietly goes on without anyone realising. I really like cows. I think yeah. they're gentle creatures, they're curious creatures, and we do have to find a way in which cows and native fish can live yeah. together to make yeah. our community work, don't we? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love cows too. I milked them for a year, and, and I really started to like them more than people when I was doing that. But, I, you know, there's just the, the intensification. There's this kind of belief that there's no limit. You can keep mm. on intensifying is, is this crazy notion that we've got into at the moment. We're kind of driven by growth, even though we know, although uh, economists don't seem to, that there are limits to growth. And, and I think it's obvious when you start seeing native fish numbers dropping off when two thirds of them are on the threatened species list, it's a sign. And you don't have to care about native fish. Mm. They're, they're, a, they're a miner's canary. They're telling us that what we're doing is, you know, we've gone past the limits. And so we're turning these ecosystems completely on their heads. I've just analysed 40 years worth of data and we've got this decline going on. If I draw the line through that by 2050, then most of these fish won't be here anymore if we keep intensifying the way we are. So what's the future? Can we have our fish and have our dairy cows as well or is it one or the other? It's, we can't carry on you know, intensifying like we're going on. The Waikato has you know, more than a million cows in the catchment. Those kind of numbers, you know, that's equivalent to the to the waste of four million people. So it will mean reducing stock numbers back to maybe what they were 10 or 20 years ago. And there has to be keeping that stock away from the streams, you know, planting trees, having vegetation alongside the banks that is going to filter the runoff. In the middle of all this Waikato pasture land is New Zealand's largest inland city, Hamilton. 142,000 people live here along the banks of the river. And surprisingly, its tributaries flow right under the city streets. Right down here is the Waikato River. It's about 20 metres straight down, so I'm not going down there. But there is an easier way, just off here. Because of the erratic flows caused by the dams along the Waikato, fish can't swim up these streams. So scientists from Environment Waikato, like Bruno David, have come up with an ingenious way to help get the fish up to their breeding grounds. How are you? Good. Is this your culvert? No, uh, not quite, no. <laughs> what we've basically got here is a ramp that enables fish to get from the main river um, up into a tributary stream that runs up in urban Hamilton. After they put the, the fish ramp in and these baffles, they've got a much higher diversity of fish up there now. Can we have a look at that? Yeah, 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 let's have a look. All right. You can imagine if you're a little fish coming up, the scale of that block's like the size of a house to us, so they kind of tuck their way in behind here. They can actually have a rest, burst up to the next one, rest, burst up next one. So they're offset like that on purpose so that the fish can make their way up through this quite long tunnel that goes all the way through. As darkness falls, Bruno and I go in search of a threatened native species, the giant kokopu. Amazing being out in the middle of a park and looking for native fish. Yeah, nice little creek in urban Hamilton city. I'm treading in the home of the fish. Come up here and then we can just uh, beam it backwards and we might be able to... You gotta sort of lull them in. Uh, yeah. yeah just... 
Look at him come downstream, this eel. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Cool. Oh, there's one. See, see that fish just sitting there? That looks like a giant cockapoo. This is a grown up version of one of the five species of white bait found in New Zealand's rivers. It's one of just a few fish worldwide that have no scales. And it's <laughs> always been a dream of mine to hold one of these strange creatures. Oh, well, there he is, just downstream of me. Yeah, all right, I'm just going to see if we can do the old, the old between the legs movement. <sighs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Look at the colours just in the gill here. So they've got That's little, exquisite, isn't it? if you have a little look, they've got like little sensory pits that come all the way around the front face there as well as down the side. So they're just sensory machines. So that fish pass we looked at, it's made for guys like this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they, those fish definitely move up through that fish pass and use that stream up there. Like back in the day, the whole Waikato would have been a massive swamp, you know? Yeah. And these things would have been all over the floodplain and, you know, you're sort of just only seeing a remnant of what was there once ago mm. now, you know? Good to see them sitting in the city, though. Oh, totally, right. <laughs> right in the park. Right in the, in the, the park of the middle of Hamilton. Yeah. yeah. No. Oh, so cool. See you later, mate. New Zealand's coolest fish, I reckon. Yeah. The Waikato is a source of inspiration for everyone, from scientists to artists. Kiwi songwriter Dave Dobbin has found his muse in the moody eddies of the river. It's a great image of life, I suppose, uh, and, and change. And, uh, you know, waters and rivers are flowing through everything. I mean, I, there's a river in every song I write, you know. Mm. Um, and there kind of has to be. You get your bearings around rivers. Um, I do, anyway. And it's a great symbol. You're full of all kinds of, um, you know, uh, great metaphors to, to dig out of the, the symbol of a, the source of a river flowing to the sea and that, that whole cycle but also the, the life-giving properties it has. But also, uh, with rivers, for me, it's been the, the kind of spook and the darkness of them, you know. Um, I far used to drive buses for, for the New Zealand Railways, and he'd stop in Narawai here at um, Turanga Waiwai, and he'd talk about Tani Fars and the river and, and all that kind of thing, which sounded kind of spooky to me, as a young, impressionable fella. And, uh, and so you, you, you're left with this kind of awe uh, awe at the life-giving properties of a river, but also awe, you know, in fear of them. You kind of become a magnet for that when you're a songwriter. You feel places, mm. and um, that that's that's the kind of intangible thing that that uh, the Waikato does for me. And so you take that into your songwriting, and it it it, it becomes a more powerful symbol in your own heart. You know. How you gonna feel when the water was calm? Where you gonna be when the river don't run at all? When the water runs out, there can be no doubt. Brother, sister, when your well runs dry. Living water flows. From the valley of bone, then we're picking up sticks from the rocks and the stones. When the devil's at your door and there isn't any more, brothers, sisters, everyone, what you gonna do when the water runs out? What you gonna do when the water runs out? After the break, how the actions of man contributed to the river's worst flood. When you think of the Waikato, you most often think of that big, slow running river. But in fact, that river begins in many, many small tributaries, one of which is the Waipa. We're at the head of that tributary, and it's a pristine environment. The water's flowing clean, and it's in top condition. It's what happens when we get further down this river that things really start to go wrong. The 
Waipa is the Waikato's largest tributary, travelling for 115 kilometres from the Puriora Forest through Otrahanga to Narua Wahia. It's easy to see from the air just how dirty the Waipa is where it joins the Waikato. While dairy farming is a cause of pollution in the Waipa, there's been another major problem for this river. Widespread tree felling along its banks has caused erosion which has led to the river silting up. In heavy rain, a silted up river can exacerbate flooding, which happened catastrophically on the Waipa in 1958. I'm meeting local farmer Arthur Cowan, a sprightly 94-year-old who saw the 1958 floods firsthand. A lot of the areas that were cleared were not uh, entirely suitable for farming, but they, everyone tried it. But there's no doubt about it, a huge amount of felling should never have occurred. And we looked into the valley and the water coming down was incredible. There was uh, great slips coming down all over the place and the river was still rising at that point. So we came back and uh, rang the police in Otrahonga saying, uh, you know, this flood is exceptional and look out for problems developing in the next 24 hours. In one small valley up there, there would have been a huge slip came down and made a lake of several acres that reached a peak and then broke out. You can imagine the effect of that further down the river, like in uh, Otrahonga. Absolutely devastated the river valley. Huge areas of shingle and, and uh, straightened the river. You know, the river flowed. Instead of winding through the bush, it took out the logging roads and a huge amount of the vegetation. Even after the 58 flood, when we should have learned, we still found by the 70s there was huge arguments for further felling to be done. Arthur is one of our early conservationists. He bought thousands of hectares of native bush around the Waipa River purely to conserve it. You really care about the bush, but you're also a farmer. I mean, can you do both and still make money farming? As long as you uh, are reasonably aware of the um, that the waterways need protecting and the bush needs conserving, I'm sure, uh, you know, the farming around that situation can definitely be successful. The Waikato is a hugely significant river for Māori. Long before any roads were built, it was the main transport link and food source for the communities living along its banks. During the New Zealand Wars of the 1860s, it was a key supply route and battleground for conflicts between British forces and the tribes of the Māori King movement. Since the 1920s, Tūranga Waiwai Marae at Naro Wahia has been home to the Māori King movement and its leaders, including Princess Taipuia, the late Māori Queen, Dame Taiatai Rangikahu, and the current Māori King, Tu Heitea Paki. The Waikato and its tributary, the Waipa, have loomed large in the lives of the Tainui tribe, and the point where they meet has a strong spiritual significance. This point we're standing on, it's like an arrowhead, and this river heads up to Maniopoto, um, this one heads up to Tufare Toa. Everything in between is basically, you know, that's all Tainui in between. And so for me, it's kind of like this is the, the arrowhead of Tainui. This is where my whānau uh, were living and for me it's a place where we were well taken care of. Um, we had uh, everything we needed pretty much at our fingertips and more. I mean we had this river over this side and we also had this river over this side. So uh, it's like having two freezers and, and a couple of fridges. Tainui Kuia Mamai Takare has spent her whole life beside the river and has seen the decline of this once great food source. The river has been my guardian and it still is, is that from it during my childhood days is that we took our food source from it, we would pull up the seaweed and pull all the crayfish, freshwater crayfish out of it, get a tin and light a little fire underneath and cook our crayfish up. And then there was also the eels that we fished for, there was also the freshwater mussel. There was plenty right here where we're sitting right now. It's a sad thing for me, I'd love to live here, in this spot right here, and uh, to be nurtured and sustained by this river as my ancestors were. But um, 
yeah, history has sort of uh, dealt us a few different cards and we've had to deal with that. And so, uh, you know, here we are today. Uh, our river's in a state that we're unhappy with. And, you know, we're sort of uh, trying to focus on coming up with solutions to deal with that rather than sitting around moaning mm. like uh, we have done for years now. There are moves to try to restore this river to what it once was. Under the recent Waikato River Settlement Act, the government will spend $210 million over the next 30 years cleaning it up in partnership with local Māori. Today there is nothing, and it's so important that the restoration of the river begins as soon as possible. In that new beginning will be the restoration of the river, how we do it and how the government helps us to do it to be able to sustain the restoration so that we can create the purity of which once was the river. Before European settlement, wetlands covered 500 square kilometres of the Hamilton Basin. From the 1860s, the basin was drained to make way for farmland and 99% of all those rich wetlands have gone. Restoring the river includes projects like the Wai Whakareke wetlands in the Hamilton suburbs. Local Māori, university and council staff and volunteers are recreating an ancient wetland. Kia ora, welcome to Waifakariki. Uh, today we're going to plant some kākatea trees. Kākatea can live for about 800 years and so, you know, one tree planted well is better than a thousand planted poorly. Wetlands help the water cycle by storing excess rainwater and by filtering out impurities before they reach the rivers. Home to a wide range of flora and fauna, they are also among the world's most biologically diverse ecosystems. Most people work on the resources they've currently got and try to restore them and protect them, but what we're actually trying to do is reconstruct new ecosystems where currently all we've got is grazing pasture. The whole Hamilton Basin has been hammered. Um, it's probably one of the most transformed landscapes in the whole of New Zealand. Only about 1.6% of the original ecosystems remain in the Hamilton Basin. And so we actually want the complete system. We don't want, just want the plants back. And already in Hamilton City here, we've got evidence that by doing these planting programs, we're building the numbers of birds that come into the city and, and eventually live here, things like the tui. We're uh, reintroducing the bellbird, and we're interested in invertebrates, fish, anything you like. We want to see back here the complete assemblage of all the species that used to uh, give this area its original character. And in fact, a number of farmers in the Waikato are already adopting this model and doing rather similar things on their own farms. Most of New Zealand's biodiversity is unique to New Zealand. And if we don't look after it, no one else is going to look after it. You come back in 300 years, yeah. you and I, what are we actually going to see? Over on those hill slopes over there, we'll have our kauri forest on the ridges. Mm. We'll have conifer broadleaf with tawa and rimu and uh, all of the main forest trees on the hill slopes. And closer to the lake on the semi-swamp area, mm. We'll have tall kahakatea, pukatea, swamp māori, the original swamp mm. forests of the Waikato. New Zealand's oldest dinosaur bone is known from the Port Waikato area. Coming up, the story of a dinosaur that once roamed the banks of the Waikato. Roughly the size of a chicken. A major landmark on this stretch of the Waikato is the Huntley Power Station. It's New Zealand's largest thermal power station, burning coal and gas to make electricity. River water is used to cool its condensers, yet another example of the way man has harnessed the Waikato. It's a huge amount to ask of a river, isn't it? It is, and it's a, uh, a resource that's there for, for those purposes. The fact that water flows from somewhere high to somewhere lower and gives up on some of its energy isn't um, denying the use of that water for other purposes. It's simply using it, using one aspect of it, which is its, its height above sea level for, for its energy resource. Um, similarly with the, with the Huntley Power Station, it's not a, a change in level of water, it's, it's a change in the temperature of the water. That it's used for cooling and the water comes out a bit warmer than it went in and that heat dissipates in the river. And that's one of the aspects of the river that can contribute to meeting the needs of New Zealanders. Is there any way we could squeeze a bit more power out of the Waikato? <sighs> Probably not, because the power output from a hydro scheme is the, the flow of water multiplied by the vertical height through which the water falls. And both the, the vertical height is fixed by geography, 
as, well, it's a fairly gentle slope from, from Taupo down to the sea, um, and the flow of water depends on the rainfall. You can make the equipment a little bit more efficient, but that's probably about it. What we need to do as, as a country is to say, OK, that's what we've got. Let's learn to live within our means, learn to live with that much power. If only it were that easy. By the time the river flows past the power station, the health of the Waikato is perilous. Its native fish stocks have plummeted and it's too dirty to swim in. Beyond Huntley, the Waikato continues north before turning west for the final stretch of its journey to Port Waikato and the Tasman Sea. But it used to flow in the opposite direction to the opposite coast. 26,000 years ago, the Waikato River used to flow out of the Taupo area and then flow down through roughly where Lake Karapiro is today and then it turned right. It headed east through the Hinuera Gap and then flowed down through what is now the Firth of Thames. There was a major eruption in the Lake Taupo area and it dammed up the lake. Now, now that dam wasn't very stable and then at some time, I think around about 19 or so thousand years ago, that dam broke and with it there was a massive torrent of water and sediment that went raging down through the top part of the Waikato River as it is today but then when it got to that narrow constriction at Hinueta it just filled it up with sediment and so the river then just jumped its banks and then flowed down through, through Cambridge, through the Hamilton Basin and then it hooked up with the Waipa and the Waipa has always flowed down this, this lower part of the course but then the Waikato joined it at that time. Dan Hikaroa has spent years examining the rocks alongside the Waikato for what they can tell us about our ancient history. The river flows past and, and it cuts back and exposes these rocks that were deposited 140 million years ago. But that's the period sort of when the dinosaurs were alive, the Jurassic Age. And a few short kilometres from this, this very locality, there are tracks of dinosaurs that have been found. Can you paint a sort of picture of what this landscape would have looked like? There would have been dinosaurs running around. New Zealand's oldest dinosaur bone is known from the Port Waikato area. Little bone about that sort of size that came from a dinosaur that may have been roughly the size of a chicken. And it may have looked somewhat similar to a chicken, of course, with sort of front legs as opposed to, to wings. We also have old plant fossils from here as well. Maybe the dinosaurs were living on those things, our old tree ferns, and, and the ancestors of the Cody would have been living in this area. There are many types of fossil seashells that we find. This is of the Australobuchia genus, but the interesting thing is it's part of a lineage. And as part of my master's work, I described the, the oldest one, or the first one in that lineage, and I called it Australobuchia fiddle fiddle. <laughs> named after Portato de right. Fiddle the first Māori king, mm. and so the mm. lineage came on. And I found that to be a quite nice connection between the present and, and our very distant historic past. Rivers can parallel different stages in life, beginning with their urgent energy as they cascade off the mountains. Some die young, like the west coast rivers that plunge across a short plain straight into the sea. Whereas others grow old, like the Waikato, a spent force wandering lazily across the land, in no hurry to merge with the immense ocean that awaits. This is the end of my journey, down New Zealand's longest river, the Waikato. And it's been a wonderful journey through some great geothermal landscapes. But I have had some anxieties I've got further down the river, because this water, it's not clean, it's not fresh anymore. But then I do have some heart that the future for the Waikato is bright because in the middle of Hamilton City, one night, I held a giant cockapoo in my hand. That made me feel, yes, there is a good future for the Waikato. <laughs>